I will not introduce Peter because he's already been before you today, but it's good to have you back, sir. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to have the honor of introducing Michael Graves, an old friend, a stalwart of the Architectural League as well as the American Academy in Rome. If the mission of the League is to nurture excellence in architecture, design, and urbanism, and stimulate thinking and debate, the mission of the American Academy is to confer the Rome Prize on gifted artists and scholars who are at emerging points in their development. Send them off and give them Rome. That legendary pile, said to be founded by Romulus and Remus in 753 BC, that has been more continually instrumental to civilization than any other place on Earth. The Academy is known for its cross-disciplinary collaborations, and as Michael Graves often attests, it can be the exchange among fellows and everyone in the community who are farthest afield that can be the most transformative. The archaeologist and the poet, the composer and the classicist, the architect and the art historian. On the question of Princeton President Robert Goheen making time to meet with Eisman Graves, I would speculate it was because he was himself a Rome Prize winner many years before Michael, and he was probably dying to meet Michael. Those around Michael as he was growing up in Indiana recognized early on that he was remarkable. At architecture school at the University of Cincinnati, then at the Harvard GSD, and then in Rome, when he won the Rome Prize in 1960, and it was then that he became a marked man. Marked by a new love of Italy, marked by an expansion of himself that would lead him in many unexpected directions, and marked by his discovery that it is important to live with artists and scholars if his one is to develop the skills, learn the history, participate in the discourse, that hone the habits and intelligence that are necessary to solve the world's problems during one's own time. He left Rome in 1962 and joined the faculty at Princeton where he remained for 39 years and now serves as the Robert Shermer Professor of Architecture Emeritus. In 1964, he established his architectural office and in 1970, he won the first of countless design awards that continue to this day. By then, his drawings had become legendary and sought after. With their distinctive faraway buildings, faint landscapes, and vast areas of space, eerily and airily rendered on yellow trace, these drawings stood apart and slowly but surely began to transform the ways in which many of us see. By the 1970s, Graves' architecture too had taken on the unique qualities for which he has now long been known. Although every one of his 350 buildings worldwide has its own integrity, it is also true that his hand is instantly recognizable, whether it be at the Portland Building, the scaffolding for the Washington Monument, the Ministry of Health and Sport in The Hague, or the tea kettle. While we have lost count of the awards Michael and his firms have won, mention must be made of the American Institute of Architects Gold Medal, the National Medal of Arts from the President, the Richard Ace Driehaus Award, the Topaz Award Medallion, and the Gra Michael Graves School of Architecture, which is taking shape in two locations, in Wenzhou, China, and at Keene University in New Jersey. And he was the first architect ever to be inducted into the New Jersey Hall of Fame. <laughs> Think of that. <laughs> He has been the subject of countless publications. He holds 13 honorary doctorates. In 1991, he was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Letters. He's internationally recognized, named one of the top 25 most influential people in healthcare design. 
He regularly speaks at healthcare design conferences and at TED Med. Regardless of his reluctant entry into this field, it is becoming clear that the state of the art before Michael was not good enough, and he is having a huge impact on this area of design that affects or will affect us all. So we thank him for going forward. There is much more to say, but to summarize, for half a century, Michael has been regarded as one of the most brilliant and influential designers and educators the United States has ever produced. Michael, we bask in the luster of the esteem in which you are held by all. You're admired by your peers, adored by your friends, and relied upon and returned to over and over by your clients. No one can match your versatility in design and everything you touch. Your name is a household word, and you improve the quality of much that is made and imagined. You're good for design and good for art and good for life. We thank you for all you've given to the world and for being here today for this great anniversary and celebration. Congratulations. Long may you wave. I take it Harvard won. Harvard won. Peter left in the middle of the proceedings to go watch a football game. <laughs> <laughs> Michael. I, uh, I had a dream last night. Oh, I had a dream, my, yeah. I had a dream last night. And I got a call from the director of the Metropolitan Museum. And he said, this is your moment, and I thought of you first, because we have this visitor from the 16th century, Michelangelo, and he wants to be taken around the museum. He wants to see everything. And since he was a painter and a sculptor and an architect, we thought you would do it. And I said, oh yes, three bags full. I'll be there. And we, uh, we went through the museum. We had a very good time. He couldn't understand a lot of things. And I said, well, let's go up to the roof. There's at least a good view. We got to the view. We got to the roof. The view was there, but there was this shiny object rabbit. And he said, what's that? <laughs> I said, that's what our culture does today. He said, I'm, I came back at the wrong time. <laughs> and I woke up. Um, I feel like I've gone to the wrong parade. Uh, um, anything I could possibly do is going to diminish uh, the parade, because I don't march to this particular drum. Uh, and so I'm not sure what my role is, because you're all here, and we are all here. Celebrating Michael's one thing. Uh, why am I the, uh, uh, do I give him a crown? I'm not sure. Uh, he and I go back a long way as we've talked about it. Um, we could have an interesting discussion. Um, it's up to what, what do you want to do? That would be fine. What? That would be fine. That would be fine. <laughs> I'm up so, to the So task. let me ask you a question because I think these guys that were talking just before us were absolutely fantastic. Um, and why they were fantastic their, their, their job was clearly defined for them, that is, what they should do, what the things that they should make should look like. I, I had the feeling. 
And I, and I was thinking to myself, because my students asked me this, I asked myself, what does a building look like? Uh, what should it look like? What should a house look like? What should this building, we all say, I know the, the commentaries about this building. Uh, I know the commentaries that all of my friends say. But is it, why is it a bad building? Uh, why isn't it a good building? And the thing is, there's very little that limits what architects can do when they're designing. Um, and so Michael Graves, when he designs a, a, a university building, it looks like Michael Graves. Why shouldn't it? Uh, that's why they hired him. When Richard Meyer does any building, it's a white box with you know verticals and horizontals. Why not? That's what the client wants. They want branding. So are we branders? Um, in other words, do people hire uh, Richard because he's got a recognizable style, or Jean Nouvel, or Zaha Hadid, or Michael Graves? And I think that's a fair question, because I would never ask the, the people that preceded us that, because it's clear what their mission is. But what is our mission, Michael? Talk about another parade. I know. Hey, you, you got me here, you know. I'm, I'm trying to find well, out what Jean the music Nouvelle, is. Jean Nouvelle and Zaha Hadid and Rem Koolhaas have their phones ringing all the time. Would you do this for us? For what reason? To keep ahead of Frank. LAUGHTER <laughs> That's you and I are in a different parade. We, they don't call us, Peter. Don't you realize that? No, I do realize that. <laughs> you compete in every competition known to man, and once, once in a while you win. And the winning isn't all you thought it would be, because it takes 27 years to build one of your buildings. <laughs> but you outlive it, so that's great. I know how long your mother and father lasted. You're going to last. <laughs> Living the last of the five. Oh, my God. Uh, so anyway. But what, where do you put, I mean, I, I didn't mean to lump you in with them, but how do you see yourself? Then don't. I didn't. I just said, because you're here on the stage, how, what is it that makes your buildings look like they are? In other words, Architecture. I believe in architecture. I, so do I. How come we both look, they look different? Because it doesn't matter that they look different. They don't look like those other people. That's what's important. That's true. Um, but they don't look like um, Mies van der Rohe, Le Corbusier, other people, Frank Lloyd Wright. I mean, you know, they look. Well, my buildings, I. When I heard Stephen Hall talk about his thought idea of drawing and you have to have a thought and then you draw it and that's your building, couldn't be further from the truth for me because that's the difference between a singular idea and Aspluen, for instance, where there are many thoughts. They are all important and they are part of the architectural marsh they're a part of the whole plan construct. Mm. They're a part of the composition. But it isn't a singular idea. And one of the things that I think all those other people that you mentioned several times now um, is that they are Johnny One Note. They are like we heard what, what architects did in South America. One line and that's it. That's not a building for Christ's sake. That's a line. It's a squiggly line. It doesn't stand for a building. That's a joke. So don't be taken in. Well, the, the question is then, if that's the case, if there is this distinction between Zaha, Rem, etc., what is it that gives your buildings the design, what, what uh, say, is behind what a building that you do looks like. Let me go the other way around. Okay. Rem made a building 
And if we had little blocks here, we could do it. But it has a tower, and then a horizontal tower, yeah. and then another tower on its side. It finally comes back, back down to the ground where there's a tower on the ground. <coughs> mm -hmm. And nobody said, why? What the fuck is that about? <laughs> Where's the door? <laughs> what are you doing, man? Are you high? <laughs> and the magazines publish it like it was heaven on earth. You know, some, some, when Frank farts, they write an article. <laughs> the gastronomic condition of Gary. Oh, you've been waiting all day. I can tell. <laughs> Go get him, Mikey. <laughs> Go ahead. You know what, in five... My buildings have the other half of that, because my buildings have a foot and have a discernible door or more. It has windows to look out of. Thank you very much, Cooper Union. Um, well, you make a school of architecture with no windows. You're going to get it from me. Uh, but it's got a roof, it's got rooms. It doesn't have just spays. It's got rooms. It's got places to be. It's got a place to have lunch. And those are the things that make up the composition. And each one of those is a place for Stephen's idea of thought drawings. Each one of those. Yeah, but the thing is, Michael, you have to admit that... And you call it a populist architecture. Who calls it populist? You did. Who, you, yours? Yeah. I call yours a populist architecture? Mm -hmm. Never. Because I like the people. <laughs> I don't... I, I, you, you, can't quote, you can't misquote me, Michael. I, I mean, you can, I I've, never I've said waited it. a long time for that one. <laughs> um, yeah, well, we don't want to do that sort of thing. I mean, I've never called you a populist. That, that's, oh, that's good. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> we erased that one. Okay. You got a few more? No. <laughs> no, I, I mean, it's a, it's a... All right, let's ask mm. this question. How is it possible to, if what you say is, is true about the way you go about your work. How is it possible to do 20 or 30 buildings in a year if you don't have uh, a, a different idea yeah. about each building? How is it possible to mass produce what I would consider to be a very didactic uh, architecture? In other words, it's not just easy, it's not just normal, it's, it's very much of, of a project. How is it possible to do 20 or 30 of those in a year? Who does them? You. I've done, I've done one building this year. One motherfucking building. Really? Yeah. No, when you were really rolling? No. No? Because, I mean, I've seen a lot of buildings. There were a lot of years. <laughs> no, 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 not, that, not that many. So you're saying you don't, you, there's never a time where you just run out of ideas in a year, you have too many buildings to do. Never, that's never the case. I, I, I'm ready for the next one. I've done, I've done the School of Architecture in Winslow. Right. I'm ready for the next one. Okay. I can't wait. I hope it's coming soon. So um, you're saying your, your work is individual in terms of your relationship to building for building Every one of your buildings is an individual effort on your part. Well, I'll tell you what's bothered me. We're do we've done this master plan for Winslow. Okay. And I did the School of Architecture, and it looked for a moment like they were going to fire the, the uh, architects in charge who had won the competition, the Design Institute, as they are called in, in China. 
and then we were going to get to design all the buildings. And I thought to myself, how is that going to be possible? I'm going to give them away. I'm going to give Peter one, and I'm going to give X one, and Y one, and Z one, and some young ones that people don't know about Frank Martinez, I'll give one to. But I, will, I couldn't possibly do them all. No. I don't want to repeat myself. Right. And, uh, you know, there, there are some, like the library and the student center, which is just so dramatically different functionally than the School of Architecture, <laughs> that there's no way it's going to look like the School of Architecture and act like it. But I, I was truly concerned. Luckily, we're not doing that. We're just doing one building. That's good. I mean, I think, I mean, for example, do you think like Mises campus at IIT, do you think that was a good idea to have all Mies buildings? I think it's one of the most boring places in the world. Okay. I went into, I went into the chapel uh, with a friend of mine who t taught me a lot, who taught me how to keep the rain out of my buildings when I was in Cincinnati and we were taking a tour of the schools on the East Coast before I had made a decision. And we, we, but we had taken this side trip to, to Chicago, went in the chapel, and it was white brick and black steel, like every other building. And then it had a rail, confession rail, which is made out of three-quarter by three-quarter black steel. And my friend got his rocks off on that, and he says, look at this. Isn't this pure? I said, it's a three-quarter inch piece of metal. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, people got so excited about the floating steps of the School of Architecture. I find them very worrisome. We had somebody that fell down today because those steps are treacherous. Mm -hmm. And somebody smart will put a railing over there one of these days, and they'll be called populist. <laughs> somebody <laughs> else. <laughs> we can't keep going on. Now, what about you? You made a building in Spain that does this. Yeah. OK. Some of these. The table won't let me do that, but go underneath. Yeah. Blackness down there. Uh -oh. And come back up. Uh-oh. And go back up. Yeah. How do I get in? Who, who gets in? It's a fucking museum. How do I get in? Through the door. Dove. Huh? You'd be able to find it, I promise. It's not obvious, Petey. You know what? I wouldn't have said that doors in your buildings are obvious either, but obvious is not what we do. Obvious is certainly not what you do. Or I would I say do. that I celebrate the door and the threshold. You'd say what? I celebrate the door. I, I, that's fine. I've never celebrated doors. <laughs> um, this is uh, the Michael Graves, Peter Eisenman comedy hour. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you've turned it, tuned in for something else, maybe we should get some questions from the audience because uh, <coughs> I don't, I don't, I don't have that many. And yeah, you know you're running dry. Let's do that. You know that. what's interesting is what's so funny is this show is projected as Yogi and Boo Boo, and that we're two different people. But basically, most people think we're the same. They do. Yes, they do. They say we're the same, cut from the same cloth. We're both formalists. It's just a different, it's a different style, whether it's Italian or French or whatever, it's different, but it's the same thing when it comes to other architects. And we're not populist, ever. I think that, for example, Bob Venturi thinks you and I are the same, always has. Well, he's a formalist. Yeah, yeah but of a different sort, right? Of a different sort, but he's a formalist. Yeah. Michelangelo is a form, formalist. Yeah. 
Bernini, Borromini. Right, all the people we teach. Right. Right. Anyway, maybe we should get, I'm just saying is we don't disagree about many things, uh, except populism, I guess. Uh, are there any questions? Because you guys probably have better questions than I've been asking him the same questions forever. And it's his day. And <laughs> who, who are you asking him? <laughs> Call it fucking trauma. <laughs> My God. Uh, what a waste <laughs> for wings. I will make wings for you in this, this station. This, this uh, subway station will cost $4 billion. All right, I'll take some of it away. Now it's only $3 billion. Meanwhile, the kids don't have erasers on their pencils. Uh, uh. I'd like to uh, add to Michael's uh, notation with a story. When Calatrava came to Yale, he was paid an inordinate amount of money. I don't know what it was, but I could speculate far more than Michael and I and others uh, uh, charge. He got up after a long introduction and he said, um, I'm going to draw. Uh, and we all said, that wonderful. And he had a, uh, a camera over a drawing board uh, which was on a lectern. And he turned on some music. He didn't say a word. I mean, he does speak English. And he drew uh, not very pleasant drawings necessarily uh, for a whole hour, turned the music off, stopped, and walked off the stage. Um, I, I would have thought that. Such a bore. It's, it's the height of arrogance. I, I couldn't believe somebody, we were sitting there watching him draw with music, of course. So that's my feeling about Calatrava. I don't need to say anything more. Any other questions? We, we, for whoever that was that, whomever that was that asked the question, we don't learn from Calatrava. He was said brilliantly this morning, we learn from precedents, and that's not a precedent we use. <laughs> we meaning architects generally. And here. Yeah, there's a question. Michael, could you tell us a little bit about your healthcare design? Sure. Uh, we started a few years ago with a company that, that asked us to do their whole catalog. And we started, and very quickly we realized that <clears throat> what they wanted for us to do was sort of freshen everything. That's a, that's a line that they gave us, freshen this and put on new clothes and that sort of thing. And then they would send it to China and it would come back about three quarters right and then say, it's ready for, it's, it's, we're going to, that's a production model. We're going into production now. And we'll say, no, it's not right. It doesn't work. And they said, no, that's as much time as you get on that. On to the next. So we let that contract expire. So you don't think everything is rosy. Then, when, then we made a deal with Stryker, who are just terrific. But like Dean Kamen, they're, they're engineers, and they've never dealt with somebody like me before, or our team. So it was difficult at the beginning, but we had a Ron Johnson who was standing up over our shoulders saying, no, let the Graves team do this. Uh, and so what we have done is made a series of pieces of furniture uh, ending currently, though there's another project in the wings, uh, currently with a transfer chair. Now a transfer chair is one that the orderly or the clinician will use to take you from your bed to radiology, let's say, 
and you might sit there for an hour, and right now you sit on an X-frame base uh, with a black leather at uh, seat designed in 1933, and then it's highly uncomfortable. And if you've got a spinal problem like I do, it's not where you want to be. So we thought, well, if Charles Eames could make a modern chair comfortable, so can we. And so we did, and we put it on, the, on this transfer chair. And the transfer chair does a lot of things. It gets the arms out of the way. It lifts them up. It throws them back so you can transfer side to side and all of that. And then we were lucky to get a hospital to do in, in, in Nebraska. And uh, this Omaha facility is, is run by the Catholic Church. And we thought we were going to do the most exquisite uh, uh, patient room known to men and make a little alcove where mom and dad, so much of it's pediatric, mom and dad could stay over during the night have their own bed. But given the defense budget um, that Dean mentioned before, there wasn't enough money to do that, so we've slimmed down the, the whole thing and come back to reality and have done our version of a very good room. Uh, the only one thing to do is the headboard with all the mechanical stuff in it. And we will do that. But again, you have to have a contract with somebody who does those kinds of things. So you just don't go out willy-nilly and design one and hope you can get it built. You can't. You have to, you have to go to the source where, where that, that sort of thing is done. But I don't want to bore Peter with this, but, but we're happy that uh, Madonna in Omaha is has hired us, and we've done a little bit for Yale New Haven um, uh, healthcare, and it looks like we're going to do a little bit more for them. So little by little, we're creeping in, but we'll never reach the the place where the three-letter firms are um, and do you know twenty or thirty hospitals around the world every year having never been in a wheelchair before in their lives. I always have a kind of one-up because, for instance, when I went for the interview for the wounded warrior houses, I was the only, I thought I was the only one that rolled in in a wheelchair and I thought to myself, we got this one, they'll take pity. <laughs> and we did get it, but then I went to a conference in Chicago and a fellow in a wheelchair came up and said, I'm an architect, you beat me out for wounded warriors. So we, we, I felt we were really lucky that, that we got to do that. But we did two, and they were to do 20 more around the base. Um, and, and then the Air Force called and said, we like your idea, we want to, we want to start with a dozen. So we did them, and, and they said, but they cost more than ordinary houses. I said, yes, they do. They've got a lot more stuff going on in them. Oh, we, don't, we can't do that. They're gonna be just like everybody else. I said, well, then a wheelchair won't be able to turn around in the corridor. Well, that's their problem. So the Air Force said, no, we'll spend it on an airplane. We, we're not gonna spend it on uh, a good, ho good house for the people to come back. These guys come back for two years, and they re-up, um, no limbs, and they work at desk jobs because there's no work. They can't get work out on the street. So the brilliant John Boehner will have seen to that. And um, so you don't even know who John Boehner is. Why do I waste my time? And anyway, um, so no votes are taken and no money is expended. 
and we don't, we don't take care of them. So it's up to people like, well, we worked with Clark Realty and they spent the money to make sure that the house was zoned for somebody like a paraplegic, where, I, where a room is 72, uh, the paraplegic thinks it's about 96, and where a, a, a room is 65, a paraplegic thinks it's freezing because there's no, there isn't the circulation in your body that you want. So all those things cost money. So it isn't the architecture that costs the money, it's the equipment and unless you want to do it, have the will to do it and they don't, the government doesn't have the will. So we sit here talking about architecture and without the will to get on with it and make life better for the, all, all of you, all of you will be in walkers and canes and contraptions in the next 10, 20 years. I mean, the ones that are, are getting on, not the kids. But. Question. May I ask um, what perhaps should be the last um, question? We're sitting here in a, um, in a university and in a school of architecture. And one thing that, though we talked about architectural pedagogy this morning, we. I know that I don't know anything about your own education at Cincinnati and at Harvard and what led you to love architecture so much. And I wonder if you would talk about that and the teachers that you had and, and then what your hopes are for the Michael, K Michael Graves School of Architecture. Yeah. <clears throat> well, as quickly as I can, I wasn't educated. Um, my architecture class was a design class. And I used design in the pejorative in that we learned how to align things. We learned, we learned Mies van der Rohe at Cincinnati and we learned Le Corbusier at Harvard. And I had Gideon for history and theory and nothing could have been worse. We looked, we looked at a little new town called Vallingby in Sweden. That's as close as we got to Palladio. So I came out of school not knowing Jack about architecture. To think of what kids get at Yale and, and other places, not Princeton now. Princeton's finished for the next 20 years. Um, but certainly at Yale and other places where they're trying to do something. Um, it's, it's exciting to hear about the options there. But uh, at Cincinnati and at Harvard, it was fend for yourself. I could tell you a story where we were given a, a concert hall to design in Jose Luis Sert's class. We called him Teeny Weeny Deeny. Um, <laughs> and we all sat at high tables on stools like Bobby Cratchit and, and uh, he came by after a party in Cambridge one or two o'clock in the morning and he came up to my desk and put his chin on my, on my board <laughs> and I was, I was looking at the, at the uh, uh, Paris Opera, a big section of the Paris Opera was open on my desk in an elephant volume. And he said, I won't imitate him. What are you doing? And I said, I'm looking at the Paris Opera. I want to see how the architect dealt with the seating and the sight lines and so on and the architecture. And with all his strength, he took both sides of the book, closed it, he said, you won't need that here at Harvard. <laughs> <coughs> he said, Gropi and I, Gropius and I are on the same page. He didn't say that, that's today's lingo. 
on the same page, no history. So that's what you were up against. It wasn't just no history, it was anti-history. So when I got to Rome, uh, I sat at the table of 25 people, and there were scholars of various sorts, brilliant types. In fact, one of them was named Brilliant. And, and they would talk about their research for the day in their little offices, their studios. And I looked at my then wife and said, these people know what they're talking about. They know their craft. They really are smart. And she nudged me and she said, don't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So for the first year, I took myself to the, to the basement where the stacks are for, this, for the, the library and looked at Leterawi and looked at everybody and, and, and Piranesi and Palladio and, and Borromini and drew and drew and drew <coughs> and read as much as I could. In the second year, I joined the conversation at the table, and I was pleased with myself. I, I carried the day when I needed to. But it takes perseverance, but I'm, I went to the school of self-taught, and David Moni and a group of six of us have written a, a uh, new curriculum for Wenzhou. And we're pretty happy with it. It's heavy on hand drawing all the way through. Um, you'd learn the computer in a techniques course, not in a design course. And you travel a lot. And you learn all the other things that are required to get, to get accredited, which are quite a lot. But I would say what sets us apart is the amount of travel back and forth from China to the U.S. and from, the, from both China and U.S. to Rome, and, and then drawing. And in fact, my building has a big vaulted roof on the design side and on the architecture side. And you enter that inner sanctum when you're in the fifth year, sixth year, pardon me, when you do your your thesis, you, you, you're in, in, the, in the structure of the, of the vaulted room, and that's held out to be a special place in the school. I don't know whether they'll use it that way or not, but that's the way it was planned. Michael, let me ask you <coughs> one final question, because I see the time clock. What value do you think Rome has that's equivalent to, for a Chinese student, that a Western student has? Because you're assuming that our culture and Rome uh, equates to China as Rome equates to us, and I'm not certain of that. Nor am I. It is a huge question. You know, the Bund in Shanghai was planned primarily by Germans mm. who came over on the Silk Road in the trade and built these Beaux-Arts buildings all along. And the Chinese have taken to them like they're their own. Right. But when you go into a Chinese garden, you've never been in a place like that in the world, especially in Rome. So we'll have to tread lightly there and let them know they're getting the Western education when they're, they're in Rome and, and in the U.S. It's an all English-speaking university, so these are kids who want to come over here for a while, do their number, and then probably go back. Okay. I don't know. But I, I hear you, and you're absolutely right. It can't be taken for granted that we could 
have them swallow that and, and come out the other end whole. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, Peter. Um, and also a special acknowledgement to Rosalie Ginevro and Anne Rieselbach for the incredible work they made, they did to make this amazing day happen. Um, when we began this morning, I said it was going to be a time where we would be celebrating and thinking. And indeed, we spent the whole day celebrating thinking. And now I'm thinking we should be celebrating. <laughs> so we will celebrate this amazing man, his past work, the future work. And please join us upstairs on the fifth floor. <laughs>